Longtime Mainers may still not like it, but for many years we were part of Massachusetts, called the District or Province of Maine. There had been talk and debate about statehood for decades, but it got tied up by issues that are very familiar even today. Religion, immigration, trade, war, and politics. At the edge of a quiet field in Bath, Maine's strategy for statehood may have come together. In the early 1800s, the building now called the Stone House was the summer home of William King, a self-educated businessman, ship owner, politician, and Maine's first governor. King would become the general of Maine's march to statehood. So naturally, um, he, he becomes a very popular figure, uh, and he becomes very quickly the key leader in Maine uh, in the period between about 1800 and 1820. Maine state historian Earl Shuttleworth says King was focused on statehood for most of two decades, a time when the District of Maine was still part of Massachusetts. In early 1800s Maine, the majority of people and a lot of the power were here on the coast, places like Wiscasset, where shipping and commerce led to big bank accounts and people like Silas Lee could build their big houses. By 1800, the District of Maine only had 151,000 people. Many of those on the coast had strong ties to Massachusetts because of trade and family, and for years, Many resisted statehood. So it takes six different votes from the early 1790s until July of 1819 before there's a clear majority of voters in Maine who are indicating that they would like to separate from Massachusetts and become an independent state. Professor Liam Reardon from the University of Maine says the vote finally passed in part because Maine's population was growing and ideas were changing. That included religion, the Congregational Church was the official religion of Massachusetts, supported by taxpayers, but new people were moving into Maine with their own faiths. Congregationalist churches along the coast and older settlements, and more Methodists and Baptists in the interior. And he says that was symbolic of a bigger change in politics. Massachusetts was the stronghold for the Federalist Party, the party of George Washington and John Adams. But Reardon and Shuttleworth say that by the 1800s, Maine had moved to the Democratic-Republican Party of Thomas Jefferson. There's a sort of interesting dynamic where Federalists in Massachusetts would like to get rid of the District of Maine. Federalists in Maine desperately want to stay in Massachusetts. So the partisan politics and geography kind of work at cross purposes. And into that divide stepped William King. And uh, in the early 1800s, uh, King switches from the Federalists uh, to the Democrats. Uh, and he then begins to espouse a whole political approach uh, that Maine, uh, Maine should be independent of Massachusetts, uh, that certain issues that have been of concern uh, to working people in the state should be addressed. And then a momentous national event caused more strain between Massachusetts and Maine, the War of 1812. The British took control of down east Maine from Castine to Eastport. The Federalists opposed the war, and the historians say Massachusetts did not make much of an effort to kick out the British. And people in the district of Maine were upset that the Massachusetts government in distant Boston did not mobilize forces, did not spend money building fortifications in this region. A further insult, even after the war ended, the British remained in Eastport until 1818. So as a result, um, King was able to capitalize on this. And, and he said, look, this, this won't happen if we're an independent state. And finally, there was trade. For years, one of the barriers to statehood was among those people and businesses who did commerce along the coast, including places here on the Kennebec River. They were worried that if Maine separated from Massachusetts, it would face new tariffs or duties when it traded with other New England states. But in 1819, the Congress passed what was called the Coasting Law. It took that problem away and one more obstacle to statehood was gone. So on that July day 200 years ago, men, only men, gathered in meeting houses and other buildings all over the District of Maine to cast their votes. Memories of war, the new coasting law, 
and the growing, more independent-minded population finally made the difference. And there is majority support in every county for independence. A surprisingly small turnout, perhaps, about 17,000 for statehood, about 7,000 against. By more than a 70% margin, Maine had finally decided to become a state. But statehood did not happen immediately, and that's where this old church in Portland becomes part of the story. The fall of 1819, there was a constitutional convention. It happened in the building that used to sit on this same site, and that convention was chaired by none other than William King. It's all quite a story involving national politics, the notorious Missouri Compromise over slave states versus free states. We'll be telling a lot more of it as Maine begins to celebrate our bicentennial year. In Portland, Don Kerrigan, New Center, Maine.